Thank you, everybody, for joining us today for the third part in a four-part webinar series featuring the Campaign for Grade-Level Reading. This Funder Action Webinar Series um, is brought to you today by the Campaign for Grade-Level Reading, Philanthropy New York, and the New York Funders Alliance. Today's topic is focused on summer learning, and we're really excited about the panelists that we have today who are with us to share their expertise and insights with you. I would like to introduce Lisa Kane, who's the senior consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. She's going to be our facilitator and moderator for today's event. Lisa was launched into consulting over three years ago because she was eager to apply the skills and experience she gained in her close to 17 years at the Annie Casey Foundation. And her pursuit and passion is around advancing efforts that put kids on the path to educational success. I actually just learned that Lisa ran for public office in middle school. And I think it was large ideas, swift action. And I think that clearly defines who she is and her role within the campaign. So, Lisa, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to you because I know we have a lot of content to share today. Terrific. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be here on behalf of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. I think the large ideas, swift action um, slogan, which was uh, – created my successful bid for office in seventh grade, and I've gone downhill since, actually is a nice frame for this conversation because um, I know that folks on this call are really eager to think about how their investments can make the, the most difference for kids, and so I'm excited to be a part of the conversation. Um, in, in partnership with New York Funders Alliance and Philanthropy in New York um, for this webinar series, it's, it's great um, to have this opportunity. Um, what you'll hear today, um, a, a couple things. I'll give a very brief overview of the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and, and why we care about um, summer learning. I know you've already had the benefit um, of previous webinar series, um, so I won't, I won't um, go into too much detail on that, although maybe we should have had a poll or testing on that. I'm not sure. Um, and then you'll hear um, from my colleague, um, Sarah, from the summer, uh, National Summer Learning Association, who's our implementation partner. Um, really an overview of the issue of summer learning. And then um, we'll have the benefit of hearing from two New York State funders tell their stories about how they've um, decided to approach this issue. And it will be interesting to hear sort of both differences and parallels um, and how the work has evolved over time at, informed by the learnings. Um, and then we'll get into a, a great discussion where we'll be eager for your questions. Um, Along the way, as you have questions, I think there's a way to, to, um, to chat, but if people are old school, you could also write them down so you remember them for the end of the conversation. Um, let's turn to the map. Um, as I think most of the folks on this call know, um, more than 80% of low-income kids are not proficient readers by the end of third grade, and that's the strongest predictor of high school graduation. And the Campaign for Grade Level Reading is a collaborative effort of funders, nonprofits, and other partners, including states and communities like New York, that are mobilizing around this common cause to address the third grade reading crisis. Um, you've seen this map a lot, um, but, but, but we love it, and we're going to keep showing it, especially because we keep getting more stars of um, people from around the country, communities, states, partners. Um, who are in different ways contributing their energy, investments, and, and best work um, to advance how kids are doing by the end of third grade. Again, I know most of you are familiar with, with um, the campaign and have seen this picture, which has a whole lot in it. Um, and you've heard about this from, from previous speakers. Um, I think what's worth repeating is our bold goal. So by 2020, at least a dozen states will increase the number of children reading by third grade by at least 100%. Um, we know that some of the most common barriers to achievement for low-income kids relates to missed time and missed opportunities at critical stages of development, and that's certainly true for summer learning, and you're going to hear more about that today. We also know that this goal um, is really ambitious, but we actually think it's achievable because of the work happening at the state and local level, um, including in New York. What, what the, um, for folks on the call who maybe are less familiar with the campaign, the, the way it um, looks in different states and communities across the country is different. There's different organizations involved, different funders, collaboratives. Um, it, it, structures look different, even if 
there's a common cause people are pursuing. For New York State, there's seven campaign communities reflecting both urban and rural populations from Buffalo to Madison County to New York City, my hometown. Um, and my understanding is more communities continue to sign up because they're really propelled by the, the opportunity to make a difference on this important cause. Um, today you're going to hear from funders from two communities who are making strides combating summer learning loss, Rochester and New York City. And I'm really um, pleased to announce that they're among our pace setters, um, which is really important. These are communities that have actually shown measurable progress um, in at least one community solution area, whether it's summer learning, attendance, um, or school readiness. Um, and that's not only is powerful because it means they're making a difference today um, for kids, but in this work where there's a common sense of urgency of the work to do, we often also need both you know, uh, signs of optimism and kind of um, insights and examples from others to um, advance the work going forward. So thank you to those communities for, for being leaders in that work. Um, the, ground, uh, the, the campaign also has on the ground technical assistance providers working directly with communities and, and um, states um, and the technical assistance team in New York that I'm delighted to have as colleagues, Cynthia O'Connor um, and Corinne Ribble, um, who's been a pleasure to work with on this webinar as, as well. And please feel free to reach out to them with questions and opportunities to get involved in the national, state, or local level for your organization and the community you represent if you're inspired um, as being part of this call. Um, the TA team works across New York bringing national best practices to address the core community solutions area. So today, as hopefully all folks have figured out by now, we're looking closely at the issue of, of summer learning. We thought we'd start by just getting a, a quick um, headline uh, of what folks, sort of general knowledge in the room and also because this really raises the issue of the importance of summer uh, addressing summer learning loss early. So the question um, for folks to answer, this is when you engage, ready? Summer learning loss in grades um, kindergarten through fifth grade accounts for what percent of ninth grade reading achievement gaps? I feel like there should be a music background with this, <laughs> but 15%, 35%, 66%, or 75%? For those who are able, click your answers now. Um, so, so the correct answer is 66 percent. Mm -hmm. It's confirmed by my expert <laughs> colleagues, National Summer Learning Association here. Um, the majority of you knew that answer. Congratulations. Um, I think all of us would agree um, that that research, that data um, presents a compelling case to address, address these issues early. And I think the last a thing I would say before um, sharing with you who the presenters are going to be on this webinar, one of the things that's I think most compelling too about the community solutions we're focusing on the, for the campaign is we actually, you know, these are real problems that are presenting barriers to low-income kids, but they're also, we believe, solvable problems. And I think that's really an important thing to keep in mind as we look at the, you know, statistics that are disturbing to also think about there's actually something we could do to make a difference. Um, so here to tell you more about it, we have a terrific group of presenters. Um, I don't know most of their middle school um, leadership slogans, so I won't share them. Um, but uh, there's a few quick things. I, I'm not going to give their bios justice. Sarah Pitcock joined um, National Summer Learning Association, which she heads up um, 10 years ago. She's a leading expert on summer learning research practice and policy and has championed summer learning through work with the federal government, leadership with foundations, and other partners. Um, Patric Patricia Kelly Leo is the Director of Community Investment, United Way of Greater Rochester, responsible for the $14 million in community fund resources. And she leads the team responsible for strategy development and program investments in four focus areas, which includes giving babies the best start and preparing kids for success in school, um, which I'm pretty sure is relevant to the issue of summer learning. Um, Stephanie Fitzgerald is a school-age youth program officer at United Way of Greater Rochester. Um, and in that role, she oversees community fund investments that support mentoring, after school, and summer enrichment programs for local youth. She's worked as, um, for, with youth and as, as an educator, um, as a counselor, as a volunteer co 
coordinator for the past 30 years, and she's certified to train in both positive youth development and evaluating training on the Weikert Center for Youth Program Quality Process. Nicole Gallant, um, a friend, is the um, Senior Vice President and Chief Impact Officer, I love that title, of the United Way of um, New York City, and she leads the organization's program and policy work. Um, she did a lot of cool stuff before that, including um, ser serving as a senior advisor for the campaign for grade level reading, working at Atlantic Philanthropies, and so on. The point is it's a wonderful group of folks um, who have different uh, perspectives, experience, and expertise to share relevant to this important topic of um, summer learning. So we're going to start with Sarah, who's going to give the high level big picture about why summer matters, and then we're going to turn to the local um, the local um, New York funder examples and then have a great discussion. Sarah? Great, thank you. Go to the next slide. Um, uh, thanks so much for having me today. I'm, I'm excited to be here and excited that we did that poll because now I know that I'm not going to spend too much time belaboring um, the research around summer learning loss because I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir. I will share kind of the way that we frame and talk about this issue um, as a way to, you know, hopefully refresh your talking points and your framing as I know many of you are our best advocates um, out there for this issue. Um, so one way we think about education is kind of like a faucet. Um, and, you know, no matter what school a child goes to, during the school year, um, the faucet of, of learning and resources is on for all children. So we know that schools vary in quality. We have certainly been very hard on teachers and on schools in the last 25 years. Um, but the fact of the matter is that public education, no matter where it is, guarantees some pretty basic, fundamental, and great things for kids and families. Um, and, and in the summer, go to the next slide, um, that, that faucet is turned off for low-income youth. So those, those resources continue to flow for many middle and higher income youth. Um, but for low income youth, all of a sudden they lack access to very basic things like meals, like books, like structured activities, physical activities, um, caring adults. Um, and that you know, lack of resources has tremendous implications for what we need to do uh, to kind of turn systems of support on for kids and families. Um, so you know, there's, We've, we've put so much focus on, um, on reforming schools, which kids are in 20% of the time. They're, they're not in school 80% of the time. And research shows that achievement gaps are actually pretty constant during the school year. Um, it's during the summer when they widen. Go to the next slide. So, so you all know, I think as well as I do, that we have more than 100 years of research that, that confirms summer learning loss is real. Um, all students lose skills in math two to three months over the summer without practice. But where the big gap comes in is that uh, low-income students also lose skills in reading over the summer when their higher-income peers don't. And I'll share a, a graph with you in a minute um, if you haven't seen it that, that kind of describes it most clearly. And as you know, at least half up to two-thirds of the ninth grade reading achievement gap can be attributed to summer learning loss in the elementary school years alone. And the main reason we care about that is because when kids are behind, they drop out of high school. Um, and and uh, you know, these days, all of our efforts that we're working on in education reform um, are about graduating kids from high school and preparing them really well for college and careers. Um, so summer learning loss it plays a major role in that. And our job at NSLA is to remind and convince the people that care so much about K-12 education that summer learning loss affects their academic bottom line. It is, it is not outside of the scope um, of, of student achievement or caring for kids and families. So that's really what, what our charge is as an organization. You can go to the next slide. Um, I would say in the past 10 years that I've been working on this issue, we've seen the public awareness rise tremendously. The number of stories in the media on summer learning in the last um, six or seven years has increased more than tenfold. Um, and, and you start to see references in, in popular media a lot more. We, we have so many op-eds, so many people weighing in. You've got Forbes and Fortune magazine, people, people that have a business perspective you know, on, on education weighing in on, on the drain that summer learning loss puts on 
um, our economy. And Malcolm Gladwell has this great quote in his book, Outliers, basically just confirming the, the advantage that wealthy students have over poor students doesn't really have much to do with, with school. It has a lot to do with what happens to them um, over the summer. So this is the kind of seminal slide. I, I hope you've all seen it. Um, but this is summer learning loss um, in, a, in a nutshell. So these three lines, the, the top bar is the achievement levels of the highest income kids, the middle bar is middle income, and the lowest bar is the, um, the, the lowest income students. This is from Baltimore City Public Schools. And what you see to the far left are their test scores when they um, entered first grade. So we know that even kids starting kindergarten, starting first grade, there, there are achievement gaps. Um, and that's why the campaign's focus on school readiness and early learning is so critical, because those gaps start at birth, if not before. Um, but those gaps, are, they're smaller to start. And what you see is you know, all kids are kind of achieving at the same rate during those white spans, and that's the school year. Um, and then those peach bars is, is the summer, and that's where you see the high income kids they're achieving at virtually the same rate whether they're in school or not. But your lower income kids are losing a little bit each summer. And incrementally, that adds up. So when you get to the end of fifth grade, that right side of the chart, that's a two and a half year gap um, by the end of fifth grade, the majority of which comes from summer learning loss. So that's, that's why this issue has gained so much traction. So the good news is, there we go. Um, there's a lot of research showing that, like Lisa said, these are solvable problems. This is, there's something we can do about this. Um, high quality programs work. We know a lot about what quality means um, in a variety of settings. So there's formal enrollment-based programs. There's also at-home and drop-in models that have proven to be very effective, particularly around literacy and book distribution. Um, so uh, you know, th there's, there's very good news out there. Um, go to the next slide, which is a little bit more about kind of the bad news. The bad news is we have not done enough to get everyone access to these kinds of high quality experiences. So I'm going to share some statistics with you um, that we just pulled together for a partnership we're in with the White House. Um, but in 2014, only one in six youth that are eligible for summer food service um, received their meals. So, so essentially, 85% of kids who rely on their school for breakfast, lunch, and maybe supper during the school year do not access those meals in the summer, 85% drop. Um, so this is something, there has been some coordinated efforts really taking, taking charge the last few years to focus on. And, and we've seen real improvements from the USDA, from partners like No Kid Hungry at Share Our Strength. Um, and so I do think we're moving the needle for the first time in over a decade on summer meals. But it's a tremendous opportunity. This is a data point that everyone responds to. No one, no one will disagree with you that young people need food um, in the summer. So it's, it's very powerful data that exists at the state level. Um, and, and it enables us to try to get creative with partnerships, like with libraries as meal sites and with mobile feeding sites. Um, and NSLA is working on the policy side to make it easier to feed kids in the summer. So that's a big part of what we're working with on um, child nutrition reauthorization. Another stat is that about a third of households uh, report that at least one child participates in a summer program. So that means that two-thirds are in parent care or self-care in the summer. Um, so that's a lot. So we as an organization really made a strategic shift a few years ago away from just to focus on brick and mortar programs to Anytime, anywhere learning. Where can we inject learning into community settings and into homes? Because most kids are not sitting in a program all day. Um, so that's been a really exciting change in the field, and this is where we start to see housing authorities playing a big role in providing learning opportunities. You've got barber shops and pediatricians' offices now handing out books. Um, we're seeing really innovative cross-sector partnerships to help provide more learning opportunities um, throughout the summer months. So nationally, 51% of families not participating in a summer program say they would if one was available to them. And I wanted to share the numbers from New York. It's slightly higher in New York State. It's 54% of families statewide, but it's 72% in New York City. There's a lot of unmet demand out there. Um, and I want to just 
say a couple things about this. You know, we've got the achievement gap, but you've probably also heard of the opportunity gap. Um, and, and that is really the cause of the achievement gap. It's not that any of our young people don't have the talent or skill or drive to learn, it's that they lack the opportunity. Um, so over the last 40 years, if you look at consumer expenditure surveys, upper income parents have increased what they spend on enrichment for their children by $5,300 a year. And over the same time period, lower income families have only been able to increase by $480 per year. So it's a like 250% difference, um, widening what was already a wide gap 40 years ago. <clears throat> so that's kind of what the opportunity gap looks like. And, and part of the reason behind this change is we've seen a huge change in kind of family structure and home life in the last 40 or 50 years. So in, in 1960, only 9% of children lived with an unmarried parent, and today that's 34% of children live with an unmarried parent. And, and parents, unmarried parents, are required to work to qualify for public assistance. Um, so those parents are not in the home. So childcare has become this tremendous issue that is holding back um, working parents, and I, and I think we're going to see more and more about that conversation in addition to summer learning loss is just the need to support working parents um, with a safe place for their children to be. To the next slide. So part of the reason that unmet demand is so high is because the cost of summer programs is so high. So nationally, the, the reported cost is $288 per child per week. Um, in New York, the state average is actually $549 per child per week. Um, this comes from a national household survey. Um, but you know, that's out of the reach of even middle income families these days. And so you know, we're not even just talking about the, the neediest and the lowest income families. This is really a child care crisis um, for working families, for middle class families as well. So private funding for summer programs is absolutely critical. All of the programs that we, that we work with leverage private investment in some way because there's not a lot of dedicated public funding for summer programs. Um, it's an allowable use uh, of many public funding streams, but because no one is required to spend that money in the summer, we very often see it spent during the school year. So there's some important roles that private funding can play. Um, it can be a leverage for public investment in the form of a match or a seed investment. So this is required for some childcare dollars, for some education dollars. You know, a lot of federal dollars require a, a match, um, and private funding can be great for that. You can fund things that are not allowable under public funding, such as enrichment. So a lot of our school-based programs, they have funding for teachers to maybe do remediation or academic work, but they don't have funding to do arts or to do field trips. Um, they can't use their public funding in those ways. You can also support planning and resource development. So a huge, a huge role for private philanthropy is supporting kind of that connective tissue and capacity building for summer programs. They do not have any public funding that pays for planning, for training, um, and very often they don't get their public funding until maybe two days <laughs> or a week before the summer program starts. Um, so very often summer is a nice to have, not a must have, so it kind of gets the leftover syndrome leftover funding, um, you know, whatever's left at the end of the school year. So private funding can really, really help to fill those gaps. And I want to just mention a couple of funding collaborative examples. Um, at the state level, the best example we have is the Summer Matters campaign in California, which has been led by the David and Lucille Packard Foundation for the past seven years. And they have engaged and brought along some other funders along the way. Um, they are definitely the, the thought leader in this, in this space. Um, but what they did was build on a state funding stream. So California has a state level funding stream um, for summer. And so the Packard Foundation gave supplemental grants to those grantees to enable them to expand their program. So they very intentionally built on a public funding platform, which makes a lot of sense. They provided investments in quality. So they funded technical assistance providers to do that capacity building for the programs. They set some common quality measures across the state and just built a lot of infrastructure and capacity around quality. They, at the sort of centralized level, brokered partnerships with libraries and state parks. Um, 
which was great. So they kind of provided those resources to all of their grantees. And then they funded communications and policy efforts um, through a, a couple of intermediaries, um, including NSLA, um, over the years. So, you know, their goal was to seed this expansion in a way that would follow with public funding and with public support. And they haven't achieved all of their goals, but they've achieved a lot of them. Um, so they really have made some policy changes in seven years. And I think that's really important. A seven-year commitment is, is a long one. Um, but it's, I think it's absolutely necessary to see real change um, in this area. And then I'll talk about a couple local examples. We are seeing local summer funding collaboratives at the city level pop up um, more and more across the country. And so some of the things that these groups are doing is putting together one common funding application for all providers across the community. They're standardizing their reporting requirements and their outcomes measures, which enables funders to actually make a much more powerful statement about the impact um, of their grant making. They're also offering centralized professional development and evaluation. Again, you're leveraging your dollars in a much smarter way because these individual programs do not have their own budgets for professional development and evaluation. So if you can kind of offer that centrally, um, you can save money, but you can also provide really great services um, to a number of community-based organizations and schools um, and even libraries and parks. Um, and they're also leveraging their communications budgets, uh, so getting the word out across the community as one unit instead of as you know, 20 different programs um, trying to spread the word. So there's some great examples in Birmingham. There's a network called SAIL. Um, Baltimore, they, I don't think they've come up with a good name yet. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of the summer working group of 10 funders. And they, have, they pool $3 million to, to grant out. Um, and then Oakland has a summer learning network that's a really neat public-private um, model. So those are some that I'm happy to kind of follow up with more information, have a lot of kind of detail on, on what, how these folks are working, um, and happy to answer any questions on those. And then, you know, I just wanted to mention, you kind of heard these things a little bit throughout my slides, but just some important things to look for as you're looking to fund um, summer programs. You should be looking that the, that the program uses data to plan their program. Um, any sort of reading intervention research shows needs to be based on the child's interest and their ability level. So kind of a research-based based approach to literacy is important. There should be a role for credentialed teachers or coaches. We've certainly seen effective models that are not completely taught by teachers, but um, you really need literacy instruction as a science, um, and, and you need people who know what they're doing involved in your program to, to coach and prepare. Um, you want to look for small groups, low ratios of, of staff to, to use. Family engagement is so critical, and it's one of the things I'm most excited about in summer learning is the power to build the capacity of parents to be more successful, to be better teachers at home. Um, and again, that's an area I'd love to talk more about. You want to see a focus on continuous quality improvement, so a program that is collecting data, that is honest about what they're doing well, um, and you know, motivated to improve in areas where they're, they're not succeeding. And then finally, you want to look for or fund paid training and planning time. Um, summer programs are so short, there's not time for mid-course correction, so you really need to be thoughtful um, on the front end about, about how they're planned. And I want to mention NSLA um, has developed the Summer Learning Program Quality Intervention, which puts all of this into a set of trainings, into an, you know, a quality assessment protocol of observation and interview and coaching um, in partnership with the Weikert Center. So that's also a resource that's out there for funders and for networks of providers. Next slide. Um, I just want to close with some examples and news. We have been partnering with the White House on a very exciting administration-wide project focused on summer called the Summer Opportunity Project. Um, ugh, there's so much I could say, <laughs> but we had a great event a couple of weeks at the White House. Um, their mission is to create a comprehensive initiative across summer learning, summer meals, and summer jobs and they've asked NSLA to lead that initiative um, going forward. 
So one of the first things we did was create a resource guide, and that's what you see here on this page. It is an extremely comprehensive look at all the public funding that can be used for summer. Um, it also includes about 20 different case studies of localities that are blending and braiding those public dollars with private dollars in really interesting ways. So I highly recommend you check it out. Um, it's, it's really all you could ever want to know <laughs> about summer program funding. We also have on that same web page, um, summerlearning.org slash White House, an action toolkit for communities. That's kind of seven steps you can take now to in improve what you're doing. And as we think about the way the campaign is organized with the kind of backbone organizations and the community leads, it's really, really good steps to, to think about um, how you move this work forward in your community. Um, and then I just want to give a shout out that July 14th is National Summer Learning Day. That's our big advocacy day. We had about 800 events across the country last year. We, Cynthia, hopefully will be setting a goal for the state of New York for the number of Summer Learning Day events. So we really want to see your programs, your events locally end up on our map at summerlearningday.com. Um, and it, it helps us you know, capture what's happening on that day, but also drive media inquiries to you and to your programs. Um, so, so I encourage you to, to participate in that way. And I think that's it for me. Um, and I am happy to hand it off now to Stephanie and to Patricia from the United Way of Greater Rochester. Thank you so much. And we're so delighted to be presenting with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and the National Summer Learning Association, two organizations from whom we continue to learn so much about our work and how we can work with our partners to achieve the types of results we know are possible with summer learning. In Rochester, we face a challenge not unlike challenges in other communities our size where half of our children are living in poverty, and we all know the deleterious impact of poverty on a variety of life trajectories to include school achievement. We need to change that for our kids. 85% of our Rochester City School District children are eligible for free and reduced price lunches, again, just reinforcing the poverty. 7% of our kids are reading proficiently, at that targeted third grade point, which is a great uh, element of great concern for us. And just over half of our Rochester City School District students graduate in four years. Just talking a little bit about the challenges that our particular community is facing. And without making a change for our kids across a variety of spectrum, we're not going to be able to have the type of vibrant, thriving community we seek to have. So our United Way responded to these challenging factors in our community by crafting our Community Fund Blueprint for Change. And that's just the title we use for our strategic plan for how we're going to invest the resources we have to make a difference. In the area of children, the area that my colleague Stephanie leads, we're looking at so many of the things that Sarah was just talking about, preparing kids for school, making sure that they have the framework from birth through evidence-based home visitation, which we know protects them, ensures their health is strong, they're getting the early screenings they need, and are prepared to hit kindergarten ready to learn. That we are using research-informed after-school and learning and enrichment strategy a research-informed summer learning and enrichment strategy that we're going to talk more about today, and then evidence-based mentoring. We have a multi-pronged approach for kids that was informed by our community through a six-month-long process that we used to talk to stakeholders, parents, educators, youth, experts, um, along the continuum to help us identify what would work in order to make the type of changes for the problems that I just talked to you about. And these are the responses that we came up with. Our goals for our work with kids are simple. 
We want every young person to be ready by 21 for college work and life. And we're measuring that through regular program attendance, because if you don't get the right dose of an intervention, the likelihood of you achieving the attended result of that intervention is low. We're looking at improved school attendance because we know that attendance is tied so tightly to performance. And then improved academic performance along a wide variety of academic measures leading to high school graduation, and of course along the way increased social, emotional, and physical wellness because we really look at the whole child and making sure that all of these things are met. I, Sarah talked about key knowledge for funders and we are paying attention to all of those things as we move forward and incorporate the types of programs we know are gonna get us to these outcomes. Hi, it's Stephanie. Um, we've changed quite a bit in our role as funders. Um, so we see ourselves now as a partner. Uh, we provide training. We also are an evaluation partner with folks. But we started probably about six years ago funding it after school and summer. And quite frankly, we had a lot of basketball snack and homework assistance programs instead of really rich, vibrant, um, exciting programs for kids. So in 2008, there was a community task force that was convened by our then mayor and our then school superintendent, uh, facilitated by the After School Corporation in New York City. And it brought about 40 or 50 people to the table over the course of a summer to talk about what high quality summer and after school programs look like. From that, uh, those requirements ended up on our blueprint for change, our strategic planning process it became a set of program requirements for our, for our summer programs. Um, we work very closely with the Rochester City School District Summer Scholars Program, our STRIVE initiative locally that's called Rock the Future, and our after-school um, conveners, the Greater Rochester After School Alliance. And so each of us is moving forward in the same direction, asking for the same kinds of, of pieces for our kids. We spent a lot of time in learning circles, uh, educating and informing our program partners about our new requirements. Uh, they were new for them. They were really nervous about them. Uh, we brought people together in learning circles on a monthly basis to help them be successful with the new requirements. We provided training for staff. Uh, we begged, borrowed, and stole training wherever we could get it. Um, our focus now is on learning from one another, sharing resources and strategies, and again, um, additional training. I also do program observations and provide written feedback for folks uh, detailing their strengths, opportunities for growth, and when needed, uh, required changes. And then we connect folks again to local resources. We've been blessed that um, Naomi Erdman, who is a professor of literacy at Nazareth College, has, uh, reached, has connected with two of our programs that don't have teachers and have provided them with training and assistance in how to infuse literacy into their programs. You can uh, change the slide. Sorry, we're having technical difficulties here. Our program requirements will be on the screen in just a minute. Um, we used both the National Summer Learning Association and some research informed process to figure out what the requirements would be. And these requirements have increased over the last six years. We've done a stepped in process. So moving forward, programs will be required to have a minimum of 150 hours. Um, the literacy piece is critically important to us and it's at the same time been a challenge for programs that don't have paid teachers, uh, don't have the kind of uh, fiscal support that affords that. We're looking at physical and uh, social emotional wellness, so we're looking at 30 minutes of physical activity. Um, all of our programs have to have healthy uh, snack or meals. Um, they're focused on positive youth development. It complements what happens during the school year. Um, and the, but the programs at the same time should be fun and active and kids should be learning in ways that they don't actually recognize that they're learning. Quality for us matters. Um, so we really pay attention to whether people are doing the minimum program requirements. 
and our programs are focused on kids in grades kindergarten through eighth grade. So in addition to um, the number of program hours, we're also requiring that folks have written lesson plans, and we have an explicit statement in our funding uh, agreement about planning, training, and supervision time for staff. So we want to see that in their schedule. Uh, we track attendance. We ask programs to track attendance both time in and time out. Every day they're in, uh, in program. We pay for a web-based data collection system so that folks can do that. That information is shared both with the programs they have access uh, to it and ourselves. And what we're doing with that, we've asked program staff to reach out to the families of kids who are not participating to say, hey, we missed you today. You weren't there. What's going on? And to really educate the parents about the importance of high quality programs and their child's regular and consistent attendance there. And what we're finding is that um, that information has been really helpful both to the program staff and to the, uh, the families themselves. So attendance in our summer programs is really high. And I think the last thing I'll, I'll share before I turn it over to Patricia is that we've also moved to a standard per seat reimbursement rate. We used the Wallace Foundation cost calculator to figure that out. Um, and what we've ended up with is a two-tiered uh, reimbursement rate per seat. So it's $1,200 if United Way is the primary or sole funder. Um, it's $500 a seat if we are a supporting funder. We think this provides some equity for programs. And because we're a three-year funding cycle, we also think this provides some stability for programs to be able to operate, um, again, their summer enrichment programs for the kids in our community. I can't reinforce enough the change in approach that Stephanie was talking about from more of the drop-in nice work that United Way funded from afar to really engaging its partners in this work and the transition that has taken place under Stephanie's leadership. And we knew we had to do that change in order to get the type of results we needed for our kids. It's not acceptable the level of grade level reading we're seeing. Our graduation rates, not acceptable. And to make sure that our hypothesis about changing to a much more structured after school and summer learning approach would have efficacy, we implemented an evaluation approach. Stephanie talked about the tracking that we do. In partnership with an independent evaluator and our friends at the Rochester City School District who make data available for evaluation, we know that we have high regular attendance in our programs, 92% of our students participating meet the attendance standard, and that translates into increased school attendance. Seven more days for children who attend after school, 11 more school days each year as compared to a, a valid, reliable comparison group for children who participate in both after school and summer programming. And for our summer kids, we're seeing improved academic performance using New York State standard assessments delivered in the spring and then again in the fall, we know that we are not seeing a summer slide for our students. The school district is seeing similar results. We do the same evaluation they do with their summer programs and both of us are seeing stable testing in both English language and math. Increased social emotional wellness we're working on, a DESA pilot to measure that as well and then as we continue to track, we'll track towards high school graduation. The results are promising. They're very much in line with what our colleagues across the nation are seeing, and we're very excited about what it means for our local community. We're also very excited to be presenting with our colleagues from uh, New York City, and I'm going to turn things over to Nicole, the Senior Vice President and Chief Impact Officer for United Way in New York City. Nicole. Nicole? Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes, Nicole. Oh, great. Okay. Sorry about that. 
Um, well, thanks for um, that nice handoff. And um, I also want to say thanks to um, the whole team who put this presentation together because it's actually really refreshing for me to hear all these fantastic statistics, but also to learn about some of the new resources that are available. So I'm going to try to build on some comments that my, my colleagues made. Um, so Read NYC is the name of our campaign for grade level reading here in New York City. And we've been, uh, I guess, at this work for a little over two years. And um, it, this is a collective impact initiative, actually, that has, um, it's a multi-pronged um, initiative that is really meant to be year-round. But what I'm going to hold up today is really what's happening during the summer months. And uh, just a little bit of context about um, why we are doing what we're doing with Read NYC, and that is primarily because, as you can see, in the, the one, two, three, four, five um, columns, PS30, PS43, PS49, 154, and 179, those were some of the first schools that we started working with this in, in this initiative in, in 2013. Um, all of those schools had um, really an overwhelming majority of students who were performing at level one and level two. Um, and then compared to, you know, New York State in general um, and New York City, um, you know, the, the data was just off the charts and it was pretty obvious why the reading uh, levels were hovering around 8%, 9% across um, in this corner of this district. Uh, another piece of context is that um, I think similar to some of the stats that our colleagues in um, Rochester just shared, you know, 21% of our kids live in a single parent family. About uh, over 70% of them live in one of five uh, public housing buildings, NYCHA buildings, that ring a group of schools in the neighborhood of Mott Haven in the South Bronx. About 65% of those families earn $25,000 or less, um, which means that you've got, uh, you know, a, a very significant level of child poverty in this community, and it is indeed the um, in the poorest congressional district in the country, um, which is also not anything we're proud of, but which speaks to the, uh, you know, the vast need. I'd like to shift gears and talk a little bit about then why Read NYC is designed the way it is. We um, built our uh, strategy on the Campaign for Grade Level Reading's three pillars, um, attendance, um, expanded and summer learning opportunities, and school readiness, but then also factored in what was really critical contextually in Mott Haven um, in, this in particular and in neighborhoods of, other neighborhoods of concentrated poverty in New York City. Um, really looking at um, instructional leadership and engaging um, teachers, engaging principals, engaging even the CBO staff that do the um, programming in professional development opportunities, really thinking deeply about parent and community engagement in a neighborhood where we have such high um, rates of single parent families, uh, families who are of limited English proficiency, families who are um, isolated linguistically and therefore not necessarily very well connected to the school system, um, and where we know there's tremendous strength in the community, but we don't have all of them engaged. And then we looked also at key health and wellness barriers um, to um, academic proficiency as well as opportunities to advance education. What we'll focus on is our summer learning um, effort really fo really brought to the fore a uh, school readiness effort coupled with expanded and summer learning opportunities and parent and community engagement in one sort of neatly packaged seven week um, experience. So the way we think about building a successful young reader is really the child at the center and this constellation of um, efforts around them, many of which actually took place during the summer. But um, as we go on um, to the next slide, I'll tell you, just focus on a couple of things that were specific. We really looked to make sure, as you see up in the upper left-hand corner, that we, could, that we were bringing a literacy-driven um, and youth development-aligned summer learning program to young children, but that, that we were then doing the connection with the parents to make sure that the um, mother or father or 
others were actually um, accessing critical um, supports and really pulling them into um, in, even English language learning um, programming. And then we uh, worked with teachers, some of their teachers and principals during the summer learning effort as well. Next slide. Um, this is just a quick sh snapshot of um, Summer Learning Day from, I think it was 2015, um, where we really did try to leverage our library and other partners to really bring more attention to what could be happening in summer um, and making sure that we've got lots of parents. You can see there are parents here, but there are also folks with the funky t-shirts on who were our corporate volunteers, so it's been sort of an all-in effort. Um, next slide. So Once Upon a Summer is what we've coined, our summer program, and for a very good reason. Next slide. Um, we have uh, a really rich one-to-one -one tutoring effort in the morning that is fairy tale themed, um, and that is uh, delivered by partners um, like Read Alliance, who employs uh, local teenagers, actually, who are trained to be the ones to deliver the primary literacy, uh, liter literacy content um, to the kids. Um, but you know, knowing their children, there's, there are meals, there's outdoor activity, there are trips, there are ways to really have the theme carry on throughout the entire day, the week, the um, seven weeks of the program. So we had really high quality enrichment activities as a part of it. This summer, uh, this past summer, we happened to have a small group of students who were reading on grade level as a result of work we'd done during the school year with them who joined us um, in the summer and they were brought into a guided reading room to try to keep their um, proficiency up. But other than that, um, even though there are somewhere in the range of 10 to 11 percent of kids reading on grade level now across those schools, um, our premise is to start um, in, the zero, in the summer with a zero percent um, uh, grade level uh, proficiency level for our students. Uh, and then we offered, um, yeah, yeah, it's fine to be on this slide, we offered not only uh, pro focus programs for the students, but then also uh, programming for their younger siblings uh, through bilingual birdies to really get them building some of their core um, literacy skills, and then also English language learning classes um, for their parents at Mercy Center. Uh, results slide, show that um, you know over the course, as I mentioned, this is a, a, a collective impact initiative. We were looking at summer school year and then summer again. Um, we were able to um, really boost uh, grade level reading proficiency uh, up to 45 percent um, by the end of the seven weeks of Once Upon a Summer in 2015, which was just incredible for us. Um, Next slide. We also saw a really nice gain in an alignment in 93% of Read NYC parents who were able to complete the six weeks of the program um, made language gains overall, which is, which is pretty formidable as far as we're concerned. And then, final slide, this is how we feel at the end of every summer, just absolutely floored, um, thrilled to have been a part of the lives of these children. We're you know, gaining, I guess, more trust on the part of many parents and are finding that there are many repeat customers, people coming back and saying that they really want to be a part of, um, of this effort and feeling like the, you know, the, the demand is, um, is increasing and it's worth the, worth the time and effort. The one thing I'll say about uh, United Way of New York City is that as a funder, we were really the ones to put our skin in the game at first for summer 2014. And um, that was the only way we thought we could really get the work going and use it sort of as a test. Um, summer 2015, we got a little bit smarter about it. We didn't really draw down all of the public funds that are available. Sarah Pitcock, I'm going to be circling back with you. Um, but we, we will be. But we did begin to diversify our funding base where we applied to United Way Worldwide. We applied to um, other other public funding streams and other private funders as well and began to really be able to think about how we could resource more partners um, to really expand the number of children that we were working with and really expand even the boundaries of the work to include parents and younger, younger siblings. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand off. Oh, thanks, yeah, Lisa? Yeah, thanks, Nicole. So 
Um, I think everyone would agree there was, um, our presenters did a great job in sharing a lot of rich content about um, examples, the thinking behind the work, the strategy that went into it, and some really compelling results. Um, we failed on the leaving time for discussion, but um, the good news is um, that there's going to be there's going to be ongoing opportunities um, to discuss and, and learn. Um, certainly, you'll be hearing from um, Corinne and Cynthia and, and Lisa. There'll be opportunities for New York funders to connect um, through through your own forums. There's also through the campaign for grade level reading on April 7th and 8th a funder huddle happening in DC at the Mayflower um, that will include lots of different relevant conversations for funders interested or supporting the grade level reading work, including a roundtable discussion on summer learning, featuring um, Nicole uh, um, and, and others from around the country. Um, so I invite you to, um, to um, consider registering that for that. And then stay tuned. The, the only other comment I'd say is I'm sure if folks have questions, there will be opportunities to follow up. Um, one question or, or that I wanted to um, raise and, and perhaps answer is for funders who have not yet um, jumped into summer learning, um, don't assume you have to wait till next summer. Um, you might not be able to um, do extensive research um, and plan an entire program, but there could be really um, powerful opportunities to um, leverage Summer Learning Day as awareness and um, inspiring some action, and then also thinking about opportunities um, to expand early literacy opportunities be uh -huh. beyond programs themselves. So I'm sure we could feature examples of those, and thanks for everyone for their interest and the, and the good work you're already doing. And I just want to add my thanks as well. This is Lisa Stoll-Kershman from the New York Funders Alliance. I'll remind everybody on the call that this conversation is being brought to you in partnership by not only the New York Funders Alliance and Plants in New York, but in partnership with the campaign. The goal for these conversations is to provide funders with not only education and data, but opportunities for funders around the state to hear from each other about different examples and different approaches to this work. At the completion of the four-part webinar series, we hope that we can bring some funders who have participated in the webinar series to come back together to talk about how this looks on a state level. Obviously, we have very strong programming happening in the region. Um, and in the places, but trying to think about this work at a state level. So I want to thank everybody for your participation in today's call. I want to highlight that our speakers have agreed to allow us to share their contact information with you. I know that they are all um, available to answer questions that you may have. Um, also, uh, New Philanthropy New York, New York Funders Alliance, and the campaign are also happy to answer any questions that you might have after today's call. Post call, I will follow up with a survey that we hope you'll take. We would love you to provide some insight and feedback for our fourth conversation about what would be meaningful for you to hear about and discuss. The other thing we'll include is today's recording along with the slide deck. Um, and so if you have any ways that you would like to see us continue this conversation, we hope you'll provide us that feedback. And with that, I hope everybody has a wonderful Wednesday and um, a wonderful upcoming weekend. We'll be back in touch. Thank you.